Hi, hello, what is up, and welcome or welcome back to Girl You Haven't Heard, the podcast where we discuss things from a critical, decolonial perspective, but above all else, without the unnecessary propaganda that others love to include but we hate to listen to. Today we're talking about Black history, more specifically, Africville. Africville was a small Black community that was located just outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, city limits, during the peak racist times in Canada, I'd say. It was located on the south shore of the Bedford Basin on the northern part of the Halifax border. It is often known as one of the first, if not the first, free Black community outside of Africa. So Africville really came to be simply because of racism and segregation that was going on in the province, but more specifically Halifax at the time. Black folks were unable to gain housing and work within the city limits, and so they decided to formally congregate outside of the city and build their own community. Black folks who were freed from slavery in Canada and the U.S. or arrived through the Underground Railroad after being freed from one of the 13 colonies, many of which who were freed during the American Revolution or the War of 1812. But Black loyalists had arrived in Nova Scotia as early as 1775, but Black people were present and living in Nova Scotia before the founding of Halifax in 1749. They were present, and we know this because enslaved, stolen African folks were forced to build the city and dig out the roads. Enslaved African folks lived along the same shore, which which would later come to be known as Africville. The Maroons of Jamaica, folks who had freed themselves from slavery, were relocated by the same British government who had enslaved them to the southern shore of the Bedford Basin in 1796, so again in that general Africville area. Africville rose to prominence in the 1800s. The first landowners formally on paper were William Arnold and William Brown in 1848, so that is the year that Africville had officially established themselves. Other families followed close behind. It's clear and yet unclear why the town was called Africville, as it was not the name that they had decided to give it. It was more um, a derogatory term that the non-Black folks had decided to give the community, but it just kind of stuck. It only became known as Africville around the 1900s. Many Black folks were transported to the area via the British government with promises of land and supplies for their service during the wars. They essentially exchanged one form of slavery for another. This honestly bothered me a lot when doing the research and finding this out because why did they have to be willing to lose their lives to gain some land and resources that the governments were willingly giving out to white people for free left, right, and center. It just doesn't seem right. It's giving very racist, but no surprise there. The first record of land ownership in the general Africville area is recorded in 1761. This was granted by the Canadian federal government to a bunch of white families who were importing and exporting slaves. At some point, these white families moved out of the area as more and more freed and enslaved black folks began to move into the area. What exactly comprised this town of Africville and who resided there? As I mentioned before, the first residents were William Arnold and William Brown, both of whom purchased land in 1848. By 1849, there were already 80 residents. So pop- it was already booming, things were happening, and the white people didn't like that too much, but who cares? The Seaview African United Baptist Church was built in 1849 and it served as the life and the heart of the city. It was known as the spiritual and social center. Basically anything that went down would go down there. So parties, weddings, baptisms, funerals, picnics. And these Sunday picnics were very well known as were the baptisms. Black folks and white folks alike all came from other areas to enjoy these picnics and these baptisms, even though the white folks were racist and they didn't want the black people to be there, they used them for entertainment. So they were especially known for the baptisms and the Easter sunrise services in particular, where white and black folks would line the banks of the Bedford Basin to watch the singing procession leave from the church to baptize the adults in the water basin. There was the Africville Brown Bombers, which was a very popular and good team. One of the teams in the Colored Hockey League, so again, another point where white folks would use black folks as entertainment but continue to disrespect them. Oh, you nasty. They also had the post office and the first elementary school in Africville was set up in 1883. Black folks in the area had tried for a very long time to get it set up and established but it took extensive petitioning to make it happen. Before the school had formally opened, a local resident had taken on the responsibility of educating the children as segregation was alive and well in Halifax so the kids had nowhere to go to school. The school, however, was formally closed in 1953 as Nova Scotia began to desegregate their education system. So realistically speaking, this is translated into all of the black schools being shut down and all of the black children being forced to go to white schools. This was, of course, extremely problematic, but that's something that we will dive further into later on. Irene Carvery, 
who is a former Africville resident, stated that the town was always welcoming and folks were always there for one another. This town acted as a safe haven from the immense amounts of anti-Black racism that they faced within Haligonian borders. It was like their own little bubble and it was perfect to everyone who lived there. Africvillian George Dixon was the world's first Black boxing champion, so big ups there, and Duke Ellington's father-in-law was from Africville, so Duke would often visit and stay with family while he was in town. As I mentioned before, many places in the city would refuse to hire black people and so black folks needed to come up with their own way of supplementing their own income in order to sustain themselves, their family, and their community. People primarily began to become fishermen and they would go into the city to sell their catch but then return right back home. So again, white people using black people, using what they can get from them, which is the good fish that they would go out every day and catch and then sending them back. Many of the black folks in Africville actually became small business owners because they weren't able to obtain employment or jobs anywhere else. Africvillians could not eat at restaurants, they could not go to churches, and they could not buy homes within city limits. They couldn't apply for business licenses, so even though they did have businesses, they weren't officially registered with the city because the city wouldn't let them. And their children were segregated and not allowed to go to schools. The city of Halifax refused to provide Africville with a sewage system, roads, clean water, and garbage disposal systems, public transportation, a cemetery, streetlights, snow clearing, electricity, and to fund for community centers, all things which those who resided within city limits had access to. Residents in Africville paid taxes for these exact services and never received them. They would often go to the city and demand these services on multiple occasions and every single time their demands were just straight up ignored. In 1910, Africville residents had to petition the city in order to get access to a community well. Trains ran through Africville and posed a serious danger, physical danger and health risk to children and everyone who lived within Africville. And the trains ran from 1912 to 1940 and this polluted the town extensively. It was extremely unfair for the Haligonian government to close down the school, which was not even funded by the city itself, and force the black kids to go to all-white schools. Why did the black kids have to go to the white schools? Why couldn't new schools be created in order to ensure genuine actual equity? Or why couldn't the white kids go to the black schools? This transition only created opportune times for racism and attacks against black children. It created an opportunity to make the black students feel inadequate and make them feel like their previous education wasn't good enough. Black children were often sent into classes that had fewer resources, and thus they didn't really change the segregated circumstances. It just further created an unsafe learning environment and segregated things more than they actually were, if you think about it. Because when you're in two separate schools, you're not really thinking about what they're doing over there in the white school. But when you're in the same school and you are physically segregated from the other students, it's very much reminding me of Hairspray, when they would just send all of the black kids to detention. Like you're intentionally segregating them, but doing so in a way where it's like, oh, well, they're just not as advanced as the other kids or they're troublemakers. But we all know that racism is really the reason. So in 1917, Halifax faced an explosion. This explosion temporarily shelved plans that they had been coming up with to turn Africville into an industrial zone. Africville was peak population at this time with a, around 400 black folks. It could have been more than this, but this is just all that was really documented. Four Africville residents and one indigenous woman who was visiting the area died because of said explosion. This explosion leveled the neighboring area of Richmond in Halifax, as well as damaging a lot of Africville. A doctor who was visiting the area said that at the time, Africville residents were just wandering around, looking at the destruction of their community and their homes with absolute despair. Global Relief brought in millions of dollars to help out Halifax and Nova Scotia due to this explosion, but none of that money went towards Africville or the Africvillians, despite their area being extremely badly damaged. They got very minimal relief, if anything at all, from the city, which was basically none in comparison to the reconstruction and modernization that other areas of the city had received. They received less care, less time, and of course less money than Haligonians. The Halifax city officials did not even bother surveying the area to determine what the damage was, even though it was clear that many homes were badly damaged due to the explosion. So now we're going to talk about the undesirable facilities and health hazards that were placed in the community. There was an infectious diseases hospital that was built in Africville in 1870. This is where diseased World War II soldiers would be dumped. Eddie Carvery, a former Africville resident, recalled that the hospital would dump their toxic garbage in and around the town, such as bloody body parts, bloody blankets, and other extremely toxic waste. It clearly 
is sick to do this and it's obviously the Canadian way to try and infect minority populations. For example, when indigenous folks were in goodwill trading with white colonizers and the white colonizers in return would give them blankets that were riddled with smallpox as a way to infect the population and kill off as many as possible without looking like they were the ones responsible. Like it could be accidental. It could be, oh, we didn't know in the Canadian way of it's not really my fault and I'm not really being racist. It's just something wrong with you. The Canadians wanted these folks to die or they wanted them to be extremely sick so that they were easier to control. This to me is the same mindset behind placing the infectious diseases hospital in Africa. In 1854, Rockhead Prison was opened and so that just gave Africaville a really bad reputation. It gave it the reputation that that's where the criminals hang out, that's where the thugs and the slums are and you just need to stay away from it because it's an unsafe area. In the 1850s, the city would go on to build an open pit garbage dump and they would regularly set fire to the garbage dumped in the open pit, which then subjected Africvillians to more toxic waste. Like it's already toxic to be living near an open pit garbage dump, but then to have the toxins in the pit set on fire on a regular basis, you don't know what's burning in there. And then you also have the garbage from the infectious diseases hospital just being thrown in there. All of the prison garbage just being thrown in there and then being set on fire. The city had initially discussed other locations to build this dump, but decided against it because they didn't want the dump to be a health nuisance. So they decided that placing it near the only prominent black community, 350 meters away from the western edge of Africville, was perfect. So what they were saying with this was that the white people shouldn't be at risk. Africvillians were not consulted, their protests of this were ignored, and their health was seen as irrelevant and unimportant. Because the garbage dump was an open pit, it attracted rats. Eddie Carvery estimates that there'd be a hundred thousand at a time. He said that if you went out at nighttime with a light, it seemed as if the dump itself was alive. The city eventually sent exterminators to cover the dump in rat poison to try and help. This only subjected Africvillians to further toxicity because it would be set on fire and poison is toxic. So this was a regular process up until the destruction of the community. Eddie Carvery says that due to all of the carcinogens that came from this extermination process and regular burning of the toxic waste, many Africvillians are now fighting cancer or have passed away due to cancer. And the city of Halifax hasn't done anything about that. The city then built night soil disposal pits, which were essentially open dump human waste pits. So. Disgusting! Then a fertilizer plant was built, which again, a lot of toxins. In 1915, however, Halifax declared that Africville will always be an industrial district, which is clearly just a very racist decision. After all of these undesirable facilities were placed in or around Africville, white Haligonians began to call Africville a slum, which became a super prominent term throughout the 1960s. This rhetoric played a key role in the destruction of Africville, as once you demonize a space, especially a place with a lot of black people, and you have a very racist population, anything wrong that happens to those black people is always seen as justified and justifiable. Despite white Haligonians calling Africville a slum regularly, many who visited called it one of the most beautiful places that they had ever seen due to the view and the extremely kind-hearted nature of the people. So even though these terrible things were happening to them and they were being intentionally poisoned, they were still extremely kind-hearted in nature and never malicious towards anybody who came through. In 1947, Africville experienced a series of fires. There was one specific fire which burnt down several homes. It was quite major. And the fire department had to be called out from Halifax because again, they paid taxes, but they didn't receive the basic services such as ambulances and paramedics, firefighters and fire trucks and police and policing, which that one's probably for the best. So the Haligonian fire department had to be called out, but they took their sweet time. They didn't care to rush or get out there. They didn't see it as super serious. And so a bunch of homes had been burnt down. This was the fire that pushed the city of Halifax to go on to demolish and relocate the town of Africville. This is something that they had been wanting to do for some time, but now they finally had a reason, which makes me question how these fires started and if they were started intentionally, which seems likely. So now we are going to talk about the destruction and the demolition of Africville. The initial plans to turn the land into industrial land were revived and approved formally in 1947. 
This took place between 1964 and 1967 under the guise of urban renewal or what's more commonly known as gentrification, which is clearly a decision always rooted in racism. The city claimed that they were making this decision for developmental purposes, but it was clearly because of racism. Like, you could have developed any other area. Why'd you have to develop Africville? The white folks in the city saw Africville as an eyesore. The city made it one, so of course people would say that and could hide their racism behind that comment as well. But also important to note that the land was never developed in the way that they claimed, so it was extremely clear that they just wanted complete control of Africville residents. They didn't like the amount of freedom and power that they held as a collective unit. The city of Africville would go on to become a bridge, private housing, and the Fairview Container Terminal, and the rest of the land would be used for a dog park. So nothing that was absolutely vital to the development of Halifax or Nova Scotia as a whole. A large community of black folks who weren't controlled by city limits, city laws, city restrictions, and operating separately from their system made them extremely uncomfortable and angry. And also they were racist. So they knew that the immense black pride that was shared amongst the community would diminish the minute they created physical separation and forced integration. The city insisted on using human rights based terminology as a manipulation tactic into making black folks think that their quality of life would somehow just magically improve once they moved inside city limits. Because simply, if they moved inside city limits, they would have access to all of the basic services that they were already paying for, but were consistently denied by the same city. So the city was like, hey, we know that you've been wanting this stuff for years, you've been paying for it for 100 years, but we don't really want to give it to you. But if you decide to abandon your homes, abandon your community, abandon your sense of identity, and move into the city, we'll give you everything that you want and more. Obviously, this was a lie, but the Africvillians weren't given much choice at the end of the day. In 1962, 100 Africvillians voted strongly against the destruction of their homes. Joe Skinner, who was a homeowner in Africville, spoke at this meeting and said, Africvillians deserve the opportunity to redevelop their land the same way everyone else does. Africville was a place where black people were free and didn't, they didn't want to move into Halifax to end segregation on behalf of white folks. If you are in Canada, you own property, then you are not a second class citizen. That's why Africvillians own the land, they've toiled over it, they've worked for it, it's the land that they've owned and the land that they will hang on to. When your land is being taken away and you aren't offered a replacement, you become a peasant in any man's country. In January of 1964, the Halifax City Council voted in favor of the forced relocation of Africville residents and the destruction of the town, which had been of prominence for over a hundred years at that point. Of course, residents were not consulted on this decision. I, I've been here so long, but still, I, I love my home. All I'm putting trust in God to uh, Spare me. They were adamantly against it, but ultimately their opinions did not matter as the white folks in power had made up their minds. If residents could prove that the land was there, they would be offered some sort of payment. Now, I want to note this is especially difficult to do when the land was stolen in the first place on behalf of the Canadian government and the British Empire, and freed black folks ended up on this area of land simply because white people did not want them in the city nearby. Many were never given the opportunity to purchase deeds to the land, and many did not have the finances to purchase deeds to the land as they didn't have money. Some of whom didn't have deeds but could prove that their family had been on the site for generations were offered money as well. But this was not the case in every situation. And again, how do you go about proving that your family has been there for generations when the city is not trying to pay you out for the land that they want to take? Of course, since this was a forced situation, hundreds of residents did not want to leave. Not wanting to leave just made the city more aggressive in terms of their approach. The city would then turn to other methods such as bribery or forms of intimidation. In 1964, the city of Halifax would begin to demolish Africville lot by lot. Residents felt that after the destruction began, their home once again became like a war zone. Many would leave their homes during the day only to come back and find their property and everything within completely destroyed. 
one man had to go to the hospital and he was forced to spend the night and upon returning home he found that his home and all of his items in it were completely destroyed. The city decided to demolish the Seaview United Baptist Church in the middle of the night in early 1967. This was intentionally done, in my personal opinion, to completely break the spirits of Africvillians. They knew that the church was the hub of the town and those who remained would easily leave as the spiritual strong point in the first building of significance was no longer there. This was also done in the middle of the night because they knew it would be unexpected and the path of least resistance. If they had showed up in the middle of the day, things would have went down and they were not trying to have that confrontation. That would make them look bad. So now we are going to talk about the humiliation of Africville residents and the lies that they were told by the government. The residents were not told where they would be moving, when they would be moving, or they were lied to by the city about it. They made it seem as if they would be moved into better housing and into a nice part of the city, but this was not the truth. Some residents were given absolutely no notice, and so they would just leave with whatever they were able to grab on their way out. Residents were told that their belongings and themselves would be transported to their new homes via moving trucks and movers, but instead the city sent garbage trucks and city workers after the city claimed that the moving company that they had organized cancelled. This enforces all racist stereotypes that white Haligonians had at the time. That they're dirty, they bring diseases with them, and they're no good. A city worker who was called in to help Africvillians move said that a woman was crying the entire way into the city because one, she didn't want to leave, two, she didn't know why she was being forced to leave as no one had taken the time to explain anything or tell her anything about what was going on. She was an older lady, so it was clear that she had been an Africvillian for a long time. She had no idea where she was going, and she was all alone, which made the move even more frightening. To make the forced integration easier, the city promised consistent supports for Africville residents, supports that were intended to make the transition as easy as possible. They had a multitude of varying committees and subcommittees who were created to help and report how the transition went, but it seems like they were just around long enough to monitor and make sure that any uprisings that were coming would be squashed because the city knew what they were doing was wrong. Most of these governmental committees, subgroups, groups, reporting committees, or other groups that were created to help were around for a couple of years and it's very unclear how helpful these supports actually were, if at all. They took this independent, self-sufficient community and intentionally made them dependent on a system that had absolutely no interest in their well-being. They created all of these jobs for non-black people to police Africvillians as they transitioned and once public white attention weaned, the supports were removed and that made any form of accountability nearly impossible for the wrongdoing. As I mentioned before, Africville residents were told that they would be moved into superior housing than what they had been previously living in and this was a lie. Many were moved into low-income public housing and worse housing than they had built for themselves in Africville. Many thought that the payoffs and the bribes that they got for giving up their land and relocating to the city, they were like, okay, well, I'm going to be able to be financially comfortable once I'm in the city. This, however, was not accurate. This amount of money would pay their rent for a short amount of time only if they remained in public housing or it was maybe enough to put a down payment on a home if they were lucky. Let's talk about the problems that Africans faced after forced relocation. White residents wanted Africville gone. It was consistently seen as an eyesore, but they also did not want the Africvillians in the city near themselves or their children, so racism was an issue when black folks were both in and out of Africville. Many Africville residents, once they moved into the city, would receive threats and death threats. On one such occasion, a man received a written threat saying that they would burn down his house if he and his black family did not leave. The note was signed, The White People of Hammond Plains. As I mentioned before in the episode, it was very difficult for Africvillians to find jobs due to racism, so this did not change once they moved into the city. So now they had higher bills, they had more things to pay for, and no way of supporting themselves. There was no church or communal space for Black folks to gather and build or sustain their community, so this caused the once very close, independent, and interconnected community to separate and become wrapped up in trying to survive in a new system with no supports, instead of trying to thrive altogether like they were previously. 
Some relocated to other cities such as Montreal, Toronto, and Winnipeg, all of which presented their own challenges, but were somewhat more accessible due to there being more black people in the area. Those who remained had to turn to government assistance as the cost of living kept rising, but adequate paying jobs were not common and were often hard to come across. None of my research mentioned unequal or unbalanced pay, but I think it's fair to say that that was also an issue for those who were able to find jobs. So now we are going to talk about Eddie Carvery. Hi, my name is Eddie Carvery. When I was growing up in Africa, we had our own school. We had our own church. We had a dance hall. We had our own post office. And what gave credit to our post office was the fact that we had our own stamp saying in Africville, Nova Scotia. We had stores. Uh, we had a beautiful, loving community, an open door community where everybody was a part of the family. It was like one big family in Africville. And we prospered right up to the time when the city of Halifax decided to create a, 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 a poverty state. And they did it to us in Africville. They created a poverty, they poisoned. We had wells, we drank out of well water. But after the city came into Africa and they introduced us to the dump and the other poison materials that our well water was poisoned, they decided that uh, we couldn't stay in Africa. After the last property was demolished, the last of the Africvillians left as well. The town that they had built, established, and loved was destroyed without their consultation or consent. Eddie Carvery, however, was 24 years old at the time, went back to Africville in 1970 and set up a protest site. He was born in Africville and was determined to stay in Africville for as long as possible. When I first started this protest, it was approximately 1970. It's been a long, long time ago. I was young. I started this protest when Nelson Mandela started fighting in South Africa, fighting apartheid. And they had arrested him and put him in jail. That was before winning Mandela. I started this protest when uh, Malcolm, Malcolm X and Stokey Carmichael started an organization called the Black Panthers. I started protesting what happened in Africa when Martin Luther King and Jesse Jackson and that team started fighting for civil rights down in the United States and it was all the unrest down in the southern states. I started to protest what happened to my community. They had just bulldozed it. They had just taken our, our society and they did it illegally. I thought that if I started to protest as to what they did to Africa, that other people would want to uh, right the wrong and uh, be a part of the protest. I thought it might take me maybe three months or uh, a summer to um, get the results from protesting, but evidently uh, um, it didn't happen like that. He was demanding a public inquiry into the destruction, demolition, and overall treatment of Africvillians for the city to be reconstructed for surviving Africvillians and their descendants, an inquiry into what toxic waste was put into the dumps and the effects that the unknown waste and rat poison had on people's health, as well as demands for individual compensation for all of community residents and their descendants. He actively occupied this site on and off for 50 years and remained in good spirits throughout his entire time doing so. Eddie was often harassed by police at the beginning stages of his protest. He would leave his protest site only to come back and find everything completely destroyed. He also remembers several times when he had to run and hide as white racist Heligonians wearing swastikas were shooting at him, actively trying to kill him on multiple different occasions. His protest vehicle was an unheated trailer which had Africville protests painted in bright red paint all on the sides. It remained about three feet from the Bedford Basin. The city seized his trailer on multiple occasions throughout his 50 plus years of protest. Eddie calls everything that the Nova Scotian government did a form of slow genocide. They forced residents out of their homes, they poisoned Africvillians, they created illiteracy. The city of Halifax and the province of Nova Scotia are responsible for racism and genocide in the first degree, according to Eddie. He and another group of Africvillians had their grievances heard in 2013 by the city of Halifax. Eddie's expectations remained extremely low throughout this process as he stated that he and the other residents who were going to court were illiterate and they did not have money. The city knew that they wouldn't be prepared and couldn't afford to fight them in their own system. 
Eddie felt that it would just be another way for the city to close the books and erase what happens to the people in this town. Eddie said the reason for organizing this protest and doing it for so long was that he wanted to mobilize others into civil disobedience to demand what they deserved, but he said that he usually had to and still has to stand alone. All he wanted was for people to stand up for themselves and what's right. He wants Halifax to right their wrongs, rebuild the community, and hand out individual compensations where they are due. Eddie says that he misses Africville, he misses his community members, and misses the warm spirit that the community held. Eddie still to this day believes that Africville is the most beautiful place in the world. Eddie Carvery is responsible for one of the longest, if not the longest, civil rights protests in so-called Canadian history, and yet it is one that is rarely, if ever, discussed in any setting, let alone a formal one. His protest site came down in November of 2019. So now let's discuss the 2010 apology and financial compensation. So some sort of settlement was reached in 2010 with the Africville Genealogy Society for decades after the initial destruction of Africville began. In the 1980s, Africville's Genealogy Society was formed and began to take legal action against the city for the destruction of their community. Prior to this group, there was one formed by residents named the Africville Action Committee. It seems as if bo both groups sort of did the same thing. They wanted to keep community ties as strong as possible. They held picnics, church services, and gatherings in what was known as Africville. The mayor of Halifax formally apologized in February of 2010. Part of his apology stated that I am here today on behalf of Halifax Council to deliver a formal apology to all whose lives have been altered in the loss of Africville. He acknowledged that words cannot undo what had been done, that the actions the government took continue to haunt the city to this day in the form of lost opportunities for young people who never got the chance to be immersed in rich traditions, culture, and heritage of the town. For me, I have a problem with this because it doesn't seem to center black people. It seems to center the city of Halifax and their feelings and how white Haligonians could have been immersed in such rich culture and heritage, um, but they didn't want it because they had it and destroyed it. The financial compensation was a total of $5 million from three levels of government, which is not enough. But $3 million of that came directly from the city of Halifax. 1.5 million of that came directly from the province of Nova Scotia and $250,000 came from the federal government. The federal government money went towards the African Heritage Trust, which was responsible for designing and replicating the community church and rebuilding it. One hectare of land was also signed over as well as a commitment to rebuild the Seaview United Baptist Church at its original site. This church is now home to the Africville Museum, which was opened in 2012. The museum was established out of the financial payout previously mentioned. According to their website, the museum overlooks the land where Africvillians lived, worked, and enjoyed their time. At the museum, you can learn more about former residents and their descendants. It also acts as a place for those same groups of people to connect with, learn about, and rebuild their sense of pride about what the town was before Halifax destroyed it. It also serves as a place to remember the Africvillian legacy and its contribution to African diasporic history. Seaview Park will be renamed Africville Park, but will not change ownership. You don't find that suspicious. Which is kind of suspicious to me. If you were genuine about wanting to make amends and have adequate compensation for what happened, then you would give the ownership of that park to Africvillians. But just my opinion. Now, understandably so, not all residents were happy with this deal. Many were hoping for individual compensation rather than a lump sum of money to be paid to this organization. Through this lump sum payment, no individuals or families would receive compensation for the trauma they experienced, the health risks that they were put through, and the demolition and unlawful destruction of their community. Others believed the community should be rebuilt and Africvillians and their descendants should get to live on the land independently as if the destruction and forced embarrassing relocation had never occurred. Some were even in the crowd as this apology took place, publicly protesting and shouting not enough. Ten years after this apology, the provincial government took the time to be performative and announced that a bell which was hung outside of the CU United Baptist Church, which survived the demolition and was being kept safe at a church in Beachville for all of this time, would be returned and placed outside of the Africville Museum. This is performative because they did not need to announce that the bell would return to its rightful place after they tried to destroy it. Also, why did you have the bell in your possession for all these years? What was the point? What was the reason? 
we have come to the part in the episode where I give my thoughts and my opinions. So first and foremost, I just want to say I think it's extremely heinous that they only offered they didn't even offer African billions. They offered one organization that was supposed to be representing African billions $5 million and all of that money was not gone to the African billions themselves. It went to the organization. So what exactly is being spent on? I'm not really sure. Couldn't really find a breakdown of that. I also think it's extremely messed up that Eddie Carvery was a, a large part of why this even happened because he was out there protesting every single day and they tried to get rid of him and they weren't able to. And so the things that he was demanding, such as the investigations into the toxins that people were subject to, demanding individual compensation for each resident and their descendants, demanding that they be able to rebuild and have homes rebuilt on that land and be able to live there now. The things that he was out there fighting for were just completely ignored and wiped away because the government decided to work with this one organization which ultimately, I'm just going to give my opinion, I do think that they pandered to the government and pandered to the white community a little bit. They were respectful in what they were demanding. It wasn't seen as radical, whereas Eddie was like the far off radical experience. So because they didn't want to do what Eddie was demanding because it would cost too much money and it would make them look bad, they decided to go with the far less radical plan of just rebuilding the church and made them look like good people and then they got to give minimal compensation because $5 million is not worth it. It's not worth it and not one of those dollars went into the hands of the people who firsthand experienced the trauma and that's a problem. Like yes, the museum is very important, I think the rebuilding of the church is important, but do I think that that was more important than African billions receiving financial compensation and investigations being done into what health concerns are now arising because of what they experienced while living in Africville? No, I don't. I really don't. In the apology, the health concerns were never addressed, so I feel like that's something that they're just going to keep denying and they're just going to sweep under the rug and the $5 million being accepted by this organization allowed for that to happen. Because now people are very much just like, well, they apologized and they gave you money, so what are you complaining about? What do you have to complain about? There's a lot to complain about because a lot of wrongdoing was done. And one half apology, which was still centering whiteness and white people in that apology, is not going to cut it. $5 million is not going to cut it. So at the time, I remember first learning about Africville when I was in the eighth grade. Um, our social studies teacher basically just let us write an essay on whatever we wanted. And throughout my whole formal education in Winnipeg, Manitoba, I had never learned any black history at all. The history that I did learn that was of people of color was extremely racist, extremely biased, and told from, again, a white Eurocentric perspective, which is the wrong perspective to be telling history from. So I was just researching, you know, and looking about Black history in the context of Canada, and that's when I first learned about Viola Desmond and also Africville. But at the time, the only informational resource out there about Africville was covered by Vice, believe it or not. It was based in a series of interviews that they had done with Eddie Carvery. And there was maybe a couple other articles, but none of them were as honest as the interview that was done and published with Eddie. Many sources even now to this day just brush over what happened and try to pre up the treatment that African billions received, even though they were treated horrifically. This, in my opinion, is just another way of making sure Canada looks good, making sure that they're able to continue to play the savior role, even though they were the perpetrator in every situation. Black people were treated terribly across the country, and it's time that they take full responsibility for it without centering themselves in that discussion. I thank you so much for watching and learning a little bit about Africvillian history. Down below, I will attach some documentaries and other things that you can watch to get some more information and hear from Africvillians themselves. So thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you in the next episode. <laughs> Halifax or Nova Scotia as a whole? Wow, did you hear my accent when I said Nova Scotia? Damn.